So exactly who is the favorite to be the White Sox next manager? Let's discuss the conflicting reports next on Locked On White Sox. You are Locked On White Sox, your daily Chicago White Sox podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, I'm your host, Todd Welter, a lifelong Sox fan and the site expert of SouthsideShowdown.com, part of the fan side of the network, and also I've covered Major League Baseball for outlets such as the Associated Press. And thanks for making Lockdown White Sox your first listen every day, part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. Make sure to hit the like button on today's episode. Subscribe to the YouTube channel at Lockdown White Sox if you've not done so already. And also follow or subscribe to the show at wherever you get your podcasts. Well, 670, the score's longtime baseball reporter Bruce Levine reiterated on a show inside the clubhouse on Saturday who he keeps hearing will be the next Sox skipper. That conflicts with some national reports, so let's dive into that in the first segment. Then 63 players suited up for this historic, miserable 121 loss season. Let's discuss a couple of players that gave us some false hope. And finally, the Guardians and Mets have been eliminated. Let's see if they have any bargain free agents worth the Sox pursuing. This episode is brought to you by Prize Picks. Download the app today and use code LOCKDOWNMLB to win $50 instantly when you play your first $5 lineup. Prize Picks, run your game. All right, so every day has heard me uh, power rank the known candidates on Friday's show. And by my account, reading the tea leaves on recent confirmed names and speculation, you got four favorites where the one that has recently been confirmed as a top choice might not be the best. Uh, the one name Bruce Levine keeps going back to is number five on my list, and that is Dodgers first base coach Clayton McCullough or Clayton McCullough. I'm going to go with McCullough. Um, he was the first to report his name being tied to the job and gave a brief mention on Saturdays inside the clubhouse that he keeps hearing that that is the candidate that will get the job. Now, you can never go wrong with hiring someone from the Los Angeles Dodgers organization. But at the same time, if you're talking with coaches on the Dodgers staff, such as bench coach Danny Lehman, it sounds like he may have had a better apprenticeship to be a more successful manager someday. And that's not the same. McCullough cannot be one too. And I'm going to discuss how I'm shortchanging him because he is, you know, I think I'm shortchanging him just because he's a first base coach and he never got to the big leagues. And that's one thing I do want to focus on in a moment. But the reason I bring this up is that this is the first known baseball rec reporter, regardless of how you feel about Bruce. And I do have my feelings about Bruce, but he's an OG reporter who has circled back to reinforce the name he is hearing as the top target still. You know, New York Post and Odyssey Baseball insider John Heyman said the biggest target is Texas Rangers associate head, uh, associate coach Will Venable. And Bruce did confirm Venable interviewed for the Sox manager job, and so did Dallas Morning News reporter Evan Grant. So that actually opens the door for me being loud wrong, as I just don't see him leaving the Rangers. But I'll share in a moment the nugget Grant left that could give cause for Venable maybe actually taking the Sox job. But then there's in, um, then there is USA Today's baseball insider Bob Nightingale, who reported for most of the summer that after Pedro Grafal would be fired after the season, um, it would be former uh, now former Marlins manager Skip Schumacher being the next manager. And Bob is the reporter the Sox love to leak stuff to. However, um, he's not said much recently, but that might be just because he's been covering the baseball playoffs a lot. Just Google what he's been doing lately. Go, you know, click on his name on USA Today, and you're not really seeing his notebook as much anymore because he's covering baseball, the baseball playoffs. Um, and SoxMachine.com's James Fegan, James Fegan recently reported that uh, Schumacher is still alive in the race, but that was about it. And finally, you do have the report that GM Chris Getz could just remove the interim tag from Grady Sizemore. Now, removing the tag, the interim tag from Grady Sizemore, looks worse and worse by the day, based on, again, who the Sox are talking to. They're branching out. They're talking to guys from the Dodgers, from the guard, uh, I mean, not from the Dodgers, from the Tigers, from the Padres. You know, these are organizations you want to tap into. You know, you don't want to be... You know, and if you're getting these guys to actually say, yeah, I'll take an interview because there's this terrible stereotype right now that the Sox are, well, they're so awful. Who's going to want to take that job? Remember, there's only 30 of these jobs. And yes, I, I'm not the, I'm not excusing how bad the White Sox are. You know, every day or so, no, I've been hammering at them. But there's still only 30 of these jobs. And right now, only two of them are open. And they're both and they're the Marlins, who are a dysfunctional mess and the White Sox. So if you want these, some of these guys just can't sit out. 
And especially, again, if you're casting a wide net, that's a good thing. And again, why are they taking these interviews? Because there's only two of these job openings right now. But you do have legit better candidates in your pool than a guy who just has a few weeks on the job and his only known qualifications is the players love him. You know, and players who the bulk of them might not even be on the team next season. And players that lost 121 games. That's not exactly a ringing endorsement. And I'm not saying that Grady Sizemore is trash. There's a, I, I do like that he's a former big league player and that he was a good big league player. And that even though he was injured a lot, he's gone through the adversity. I think that can help. But when you look at like, um, you know, Lehman from the Dodgers that they talked about, they had him as the communications and strategy coach. I think that would be perfect for Grady Sizemore right now, in the right now. I just don't think this is the time. And again, the other stereotype, well, the, the Sox are going to be terrible. Let's just hire somebody to get them through the rebuild. You want to hire somebody that gets you through the whole thing from rebuild to hopefully hoisting a championship. Okay. And yes, championship, even though it seems like going to the moon, you still have to aspire to go there. Okay. Even if the team's up for sale, we know this stuff, but it, it, we have to trust Chris Getz. Chris Getz, because he's going to be here like it or not. And you hope that he's not just sitting around going, well, uh, uh, just get some pitching. That's all I got to do. I don't really need to do much. You know, you hope he's got that fire to say, you know what? I want to prove that I'm a GM and build a winning team. Even though it's really hard to see. Anyways, uh, McAuliffe might turn out to be an excellent manager. Uh, and I do think I'm being too hard on him as the Cleveland Guardians almost tabbed him to be their manager last season. There was reports that it was him and Steven Vogt. So, the Cleveland Guardians, obviously a very well-run franchise. They've been kicking the White Sox butt the last two seasons. They thought very highly of them. And the Mets and Royals thought enough of them to get, to interview them in 2023. And again, you can never go wrong tapping into the Dodgers organization. Especially whoever buys a team should try to model them, you know, the Chicago White Sox after the Los Angeles Dodgers. And again, whoever buys a team, because Jerry's not going to do it. But... He's either on, you know, Jerry's on limited time. It's sad that we have to wish for him to, to die. Um, but also if the reports are true that he's going to be selling, you want whoever buys the team to be like, you know what? We should be like the Los Angeles Dodgers. Why? Because we're in a big market. And yes, the White Sox will be at least in Chicago through 2029. There's a lease. And it sounds like it's pretty ironclad. So, you know, operate like a big market team. You know, and let's assume that the Sox do get their new stadium. Maybe the new owner comes in and funds it himself or herself and realizes, you know what? There's opportunity here. We're in a big market. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to still invest in draft and development like all the small market teams. But we're going to spend in free agency to put ourselves over the top and make shrewd trade deadline deals with the draft and development that we've done that will also put us over the top. Uh, and a part of me, when I heard Bruce say McCullough's name, I wanted to be like, well, this is just him doubling down. You know, he he broke the story. He's going to reiterate it. But at the same time, you know, McAuliffe isn't a terrible candidate. He has experience in player development. And, hey, if you can earn the respect of Shoya Otani, you can't be all bad. Uh, Venable coming to the Sox. Uh, I keep being a die on that hill that it ain't happening. Although um, Grant's little nugget. Uh, uncovered by San Diego Padres on SI's uh, Marin Angus Combs opens the door that he could decide to come to the South Side. Uh, and this is what she wrote. Grant also said Bochi told reporters following the end of the 2024 regular season that managing still drives him, seemingly leaving the door open to him sticking around beyond the end of his current contract in 2025. Venable appeared to be content, content staying in Texas and bidding his time when he declined offers to interview with the New York Mets and the Cleveland Guardians last winter. However, this could possibly intrigue him as the future of Bochi in Texas is uncertain. And what makes Venable so attractive to any team is that look at what he's done since retiring as a player. Special assistant to Theo Epstein in 2017 with the Cubs, then first base coach for Joe Madden in 2018 and 2019, and then third base coach in 2020. Leaves the Cubs to go join Alex Cora in Boston as the bench coach in 2021, and then moves to Texas last season. World Series ring while sitting next to one of the best managers of all time, Bruce Bochy. I would love that. I would love for it to actually become a reality. And if it does, I have no problem being loud. I have no problem being loud wrong. Although do a Google search on Skip Schumacher lately, and it's been radio silent. Uh, again, only just a blurb 
from James Fegan gives me this hunch in my stomach that he might choose to sit out this hiring cycle since it's a Sox job for him. Because he ain't going back to the Marlins. Um, and maybe he doesn't want to deal with a dysfunctional franchise despite his deep ties to shadow GM Tony La Russa. All right, so let's continue with the review of the 63 players who suited up for this historic losing season and discuss the players that gave us false hope and they can never recapture the shine. Next, on Lockdown White Sox. Prize Picks is the best place to get real money sports action with over 10 million members and billions of dollars awarded in, in, in awarded winnings. Prize Picks has made daily fantasy sports accessible to all. You just pick more or less on at least two players for a shot to win up to 100 times your cash. Prize Picks invented the flex play, which means you can still cash out if your lineup isn't perfect. You can double your money even if one of your picks doesn't hit. Prize Picks puts its members first, so all withdrawals are fast, safe, and secure. When your pick hits, you can get your money in as quick as 15 minutes. Prize Picks is the best way to get action on sports in over 30 states, including Illinois, Wisconsin, Iowa, Michigan, and, and Indiana. So let's see. Fun, simple concept of just picking more or less uh, with a chance to double your money if the pick hits. And I can get my money quickly and use it pretty much in any state and use the uh, app in pretty much any state in the Midwest. Sign me up. Sign up today and get $50 instantly when you play $5. You don't even need to win to receive the $50 bonus. It's guaranteed. Prize Picks also offers weekly promotions that can lead to big payouts like Taco Tuesday. Each Tuesday, Prize Picks discounts select players' projections up to 25% to provide even more value for your lineups. Run your game all season long on Prize Picks. Welcome back into Lockdown White Sox. I'm your host, Todd Welter. Again, make sure to hit the like button on today's episode and subscribe to the YouTube channel at Lockdown White Sox if you've not done so already. And if you can't catch the show on YouTube, Lockdown White Sox is available on all major podcast platforms, so make sure to follow or subscribe on places such as Apple and Spotify. Either way, get your 30-minute fix of Chicago White Sox baseball venting with me. All right, so I got four players that gave us false hope this season. One from a trade return perspective. Another that could have been great, you know, that could have been a great find off the scrap heap, but turned out to be a pumpkin. And then two pitchers, however, and then two pitchers. However, let's not give up on those uh, two pitchers just yet. Those are the two players that I would say can regain their shine. Where Tommy Pham, for example, he's the first player that I'm listing as giving us false hope, but that is because of the trade return, you know, hope. We, we kept hearing about how, Oh, the Sox could get something good for Tommy Pham. It's a good, good thing that they signed him, you know, brought him in during the season. Good thing that they're bringing him in. He's going to be a veteran presence in the clubhouse. You know, he's going to be, he's going to bring a great return. And turns out, nope, didn't happen. You know, in the front, when the front office probably found out his trade value was the same as it was last year when the New York Mets got a scratch off prospect from the Diamondbacks. He was pretty much a throw-in player in the Eric Fetty, Michael Kopak three-team trade deal, three-team deal at the trade deadline. And man, had the Dodgers come out looking amazing. Tommy Edmond just won the NLCS MVP for driving in 11 runs. Kopak has been dominant out of the pen for the Dodgers. And all the Dodgers had to do was give up Miguel Vargas and two scratch-off prospects to the Sox, while Fetty and Pham didn't help the Cardinals at all. You know, Pham was DFA'd. Still made the playoffs with the Royals, but, you know, Fetty and Fam were brought in to help the Cardinals overtake the Brewers. Didn't happen. Cardinals didn't even come close to the playoffs. And, again, all they had to do was give up Miguel Vargas, a scratch-off prospect with a broken leg, and another prospect that's got some potential. But, again, he's at single A. That is an amazing deal. Um, anyways, there was hope that if Fam kept playing well, the Sox could get a decent asset, a decent asset. And instead, he just ended up wasting Dominic Fletcher's development time. Corey Jolks came in, came to the Sox in mid-May, in a mid-May trade after being after, in a mid-May trade after being designated for assignment by the Houston Astros. Uh, first joined the team, he looked like he could be a steal. He looked like he could be one of those guys that hey, they found somebody off the scrap heap. You know, he may not be Brent Rooker, but he might be a player that you know could be in the lineup every day. Still relatively young. Has some tools. Hey, here we go. You know, hit 297 with an 882 OPS and 37 at bats in May. A rare bright spot in a terrible season until the calendar turned to June, and then he became a pumpkin. 
you know, it definitely struck midnight on his potential of being um, an everyday player for the White Sox. 206 average and a 598 OPS in June. Playing time decreased in July to just 12 at bats. And he had a 167 average with a 481 OPS that month. Got some ABs in August, but still nothing special as he had a 216, 250, 216 slash line that month, and then a 125 average for the month of September. And off the 26 man roster, he went on September 16th. And he's probably never going to be heard from again, at least in the White Sox. I would not bring him back. You just, you know, you've got Zach Deloach, you got Dominique Fletcher. Um, you still claim to like Oscar Colas. You might move Brian Ramos to the outfield. You know, thank you for those at bats in May, Corey. But otherwise, on your wayward journey, you go. Uh, reliever Jordan Le- Leisure obtained the Lance Lynn deal with the Dodgers last year. The rookie had a good spring training, uh, got off to a great start, did not give up a run until his eighth appearance of the season on April 21st. 327 ERA in April, 231 ERA posted in the month of May, and then the wheels just came off. 10 point, uh, 1080 ERA. That earned him a demo in June. Earned him a demotion. He did briefly return in July where he gave up nine earned runs in two and two-thirds innings and three appearances. Whew. I mean, he looked nothing like the promise he showed in April and May. Goes on the IL with a uh, shoulder impingement um, injury. Did rehab enough to heal up, but was still never brought back uh, end of the season in AAA Charlotte. Um, now, he's not someone I want to give up on as he's still 26. And, hey, relievers are like volatile stocks. They're always up and down, up and down especially in the beginning. So you might as well hang on to it, hang on to this asset, see if he can make some adjustments in the off season, uh, regain his command and maybe be able to pitch through an entire, uh, you know, pitch well beyond May. Cause maybe he just ran out of gas, especially with the shoulder impingement problems. Nick Nastrini, another one of those starting pitching prospects that provided some excitement about better days ahead. He also came over in the deal with leisure, made his debut on April 15th against the Royals. And pitched well in five innings of work. And you're like, hey, here we go. We got some promise. But gets rocked in his next uh, outing against the Phillies. Gets demoted again because the front office, for some stupid reason, instead of seeing, hey, can this kid bounce back, they want to see what Brad Keller and Mike Clevenger can do. God, that was so, I mean, again, so much time wasted. Um, comes back in late May. Got four starts through um, early June, but really struggled with his command and got sent back down again. And then he struggled in trip, uh, AAA. However, he credited working with some of the veteran pitchers making rehab assignments like Dominic Leone. And he started to pitch much better in Charlotte. Gets one more call up. So that's three tours of duty. It was outstanding against the Texas Rangers on August 29th. Um, probably the best start he had all year, but his next two starts were duds. He gets demoted again. I'm not ready to give up on him either as... He just has to get better with his command. If he can figure out his command at the big league level, I think that we, we've got the makings of a, a very solid pitcher. He's got really good stuff, uh, but he posted a 1.91 whip. I mean, you got to get your command under control, young man. Although with Sean Burke and Davis Martin showing more promise and probably nailing down rotation spots for next season, plus Drew Thorpe and Jonathan Cannon probably having solidified solidified spots already, and if Garrett Crochet is not traded, Nasherini is looking at probably going back to AAA again next season. Or maybe you might want to think, can he help us in the bullpen? All right, well, two more teams were eliminated from the playoffs over the weekend. Let's see if they have any bargain free agents that the Sox could pursue this offseason next on Lockdown White Sox. Hey, NFL fans, you can start the season with a big return on FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. So when you get a hunch in the middle of the game, you can check out the latest stats, view live play-by-play, and so much more on the same page where you place your bets. You'll get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet. The traditional spreads, money lines, and over-unders are always fun to play on FanDuel, but it's the props, parlays, and futures where you can really hit it big. Popular parlay for tonight's Baltimore and Tampa game is Derrick Henry, Zay Flowers, Mike Evans, and Chris Godwin, all scoring an anytime touchdown. That is at plus 2196. And if you put 10 bucks on that and it hits, you just won $219.61. Lad McConkey scoring the first or the last touchdown are both at plus 1100. Anytime TD by him is plus 210. So you at least have a chance to double your money there or possibly turn, say, 10 bucks into 110 if that first TD or last TD prop hits. Still some good lines on NBA championship winners. The Celtics are FanDuel's uh, favorite, and even then, 
plus 310, so that hits, tripled your money. But say you're a homer like me, think the Bucks can bounce back and reclaim the crown, the crown plus 1400. That's fanduel.com. Welcome back to Locked On White Sox. I'm your host, Todd Welter. Again, shout out to all my everydayers. Appreciate your loyalty. Again, please hit the uh, like button on today's episode. Recommend to your fellow Sox fans or baseball fan friends to subscribe to the YouTube channel at Locked On White Sox or wherever they get their podcasts as the show is available on all major platforms. And I do appreciate, you know, hearing some good feedback from fans of other teams coming, listening to the show because they're checking in to see, is it really that bad? Y- yes, it is. And hopefully I am informing you and entertaining you. Not only because, again, my goal, inform, entertain, challenge, uh, get you all the information I possibly can, not only to the White Sox fans, but baseball fans. I love talking baseball. Although, can I just say this? Uh, being the site expert of the SouthsideShowdown.com, uh, the f- the Facebook community that I have to deal with on there, oh, boy, that is such a negative, negative place. Like, say what you want about Twitter, but, man, like, that's why I love our YouTube community, too. Let's build that up. You know, yeah, we, we've got some negative comments. I mean, it's not positive being a White Sox fan, but at least some of the, a lot of the commenters that post are at least either entertaining or at least you can circle back and say, hey, make a better point. Because again, we can disagree. That's fine. Disagreement is okay. Just make good points. All right. Do not expect the White Sox to sign any bargain free agents from the Guardians. Because once again, let's acknowledge, first of all, how awful it is that you and I have to look at what's on the discount rack in free agency. See if the Sox can find any help. You lose 121 games. I actually don't mind the Sox going with younger players, especially give them some runway, as you do have some prospects that should be given a long look. Give Edgar Carroll the starting job at catcher and give him 600 at-bats. I mean, unless he's just so awful at the plate, give him his run. I do think Colson Montgomery should maybe not come up until May, you know, just so they can prove that his – Hot hitting in the Arizona Fall League and his hot hitting 10 September isn't an aberration because you still want to hope he hits his floor. I mean, it hits a ceiling because right now his floor is Paul DeYoung. <laughs> um, Brian Ramos, you know, definitely want to see what he can do with five, 600 at bats. I mean, Lenin Sosa is a decent bridge. Let's see if he can at least replicate replacement level production at second base. Because if anything, you can have him then on a cheap deal for a couple of seasons because you've been trying to replace Ray Durham. It's not ideal, but at least it's something better than what you've been dealing with. But at the same time, you would like to say, hey, you know what? Colson Montgomery might not be a long-term um, answer at shortstop. Willie Adamas, we're going to sign him because he can produce power. He's a decent fielder. And guess what? He's a great clubhouse leader. We need that. Anthony Santander. Let's get his hitting approach in here and his power. But no, 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 no. Got to cut payroll because let's uh, start our own regional sports network. You know, this is what the White Sox did. And let's just not even get an agreement yet at all with Comcast and then be miffed that they decided, huh, we're not going to give you an offer. Hmm, Wonder why. I mean, I know they're pulling out of the RSN business, but still you just literally left them. They're NBC Sports Chicago. You just leave. And out of that, you kind of hastily put it together without any leverage. Yeah, and I wonder why your revenue is drying up. And yeah, you did lose a lot of money by people not coming up. But guess what? Give us a reason to show up. Sorry, Jerry. We're a fan base that wants something to watch. And we want to watch winning. Or at least we want to watch good players on the baseball field, even on losing teams. Okay. You don't have that right now. There's no draw except for Garrett Crochet every five days. And maybe Jonathan Cannon, some of the younger pitching, but even then, that's only every five days. You know, I want to see Luis Robert Jr., for example, get back to his hitting form. I want to see more of those guys in the lineup. Anyways, the one reason to ignore the Guardians is they have nothing but starting pitching and a catcher on the market. And I don't want any veteran starting pitching pitchers blocking the young arms, getting innings next season. I don't want another Chris Flexen or Michael Soroka in the rotation next year. I want a clear runway for a lot of these young potential arms, and I don't want the thought of Alex Cobb or Matt Boyd getting in the way. I just don't want that, okay? Let's give these guys a full you know, full runway. And let, again, unless they're absolutely atrocious, you have a lot of pitching depth, so let's use next season to start ironing out the rotation 
that can hopefully get you back to being competitive by 2027. The Mets, however, do have some veterans that could make sense. Again, nothing great. Let's reiterate before you're like, why are you throwing these names out there? Remember, the Sox are going to be shopping at the discount rack and the scrap heap sections. So feel free to rant about that. But Harrison Bader, according to Spot Track, uh, could earn around $7.1 million, or Jesse Winker and his forecasted $2.4 million would be viable veteran uh, outfield signings, especially if you want to push, push uh, Dominic Fletcher and Zach Deloach. Although, again, they may move Brian Ramos to the outfield. So maybe you want to leave that um, clean, you know, clear up. But Winker, he might be a jerk, but he can hit for some power and he gets on base and he can play first base and he can DH. So if you want to replace Andrew Vaughn, who's going to come at $6 million projected in arbitration, maybe Winker could be your guy, especially he's left-handed. And if he produces similar to his 253 average and 675 OPS with a 1.86 war, uh, that's somebody that you could flip maybe at the deadline for a decent ass uh, for a decent asset because um, did I just say decent bleep. Well, sorry, decent asset. All right. Sorry about that. But you could flip him for a decent asset. Uh, Ryan Stanek uh, could be a veteran reliever worth bringing in. His ERA has always been up and down, but I'm going to make an exception for the season. And with the limited dollars the Sox have, I was very against them spending it, obviously, during the contention window. But right now, feel free to, you know, with with your limited free agent dollars to spend it on relievers because you can flip relievers at the deadline for good assets. Um, you know, this year's deadline market showed that. It was excellent for relievers. And you're seeing the value in bullpenning that contenders have. I mean, the Dodgers bullpen had two bullpenning games. You know, you're starting to see teams be like, you know what? Maybe it should be Johnny Allstaff on this game, and then let's save our other, you know, our, our better arm, our better starting arm for the next, you know, for the elimination game, for example. But it does suck to see that the Sox will be sitting out, say, the the, the Pete Alonzo market. But, hey, you and I, uh, well, we're, we're used to the Sox not spending. So, you know, it's a sad lot in life, I guess. But the way I look at it, this is part of my penance and how I'm going to have redemption in, in the afterlife. All right. Well, that wraps up this edition of Lockdown White Sox. Thank you for making Lockdown White Sox your first listen today. For your second listen, find Lockdown MLB Baseball Guru Sully. Brings a daily blend of humor and baseball, keeping you updated on every aspect of the playoff picture. Find Lockdown MLB on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. I'll be back tomorrow with a conversation with SoxMachine.com's Josh Nelson as we will discuss the recent Sox might be for sale news. The Chicago Fire potentially teaming up with the Sox to have new stadiums on the 78. Uh, the manager search and just the least valuable roster ever constructed this season. Feel free to leave comments about today's discussion regarding who is the favorite to be the Sox manager, the players who gave us false hope, and any bargain free agents the Sox could pursue with the Mets or Guardians. You can leave them at the episode page on YouTube, X, formerly Twitter, at Tajay Dub or at Lockdown Sox, or you can email me at LockdownWhiteSox at gmail.com. Have a great day. I'll see you tomorrow.